Hello, and welcome to today's trainer education webinar, Courageous Leadership, Using Courage to Transform the Workplace, hosted by HRDQ and presented by Bill Treasurer. Today's webinar will last approximately an hour. Before we begin, note that there is a question, or maybe it's listed as a chat box on your system. Usually it's in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You're going to want to use this during the webinar to submit any questions. And then we'll either answer those questions as they come in, during the Q&A at the end of the session, or by email after the session. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's webinar. I'm in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Today's presenter is Bill Treasurer. Bill is a leadership expert and the originator of the new organizational practice of courage building. He is also the author of several books, including Right Risk and the international bestseller, Courage Goes to Work. Bill's latest publication is Courageous Leadership, a program for using courage to transform the workplace. It is a comprehensive, off-the-shelf program that can be used to build courage in any organization. Bill is the founder and chief encouragement officer at Giant Leap Consulting, a courage-building company that helps people and organizations live more courageously. Bill has conducted more than 500 corporate workshops designed to strengthen people's leadership skills and improve team performance. His clients include Accenture, PNC Bank, NASA, UNICEF, Banks, CNN, and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today, Bill. Sarah, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. Uh, first of all, let me thank Sarah Montgomery and the folks at HRDQ. They have been just very gracious in giving me their time and energy as we've gotten ready uh, to prepare for this webinar. And as a result of that, we've got over 500 registrants for today's webinar all over the world. I'm excited to be part of the Trainer Education Webinar Series and very excited that all of you have showed up for today's webinar. And it doesn't surprise me. This idea of courage seems to resonate people with people around the globe Cross-culturally, the idea of courage, I believe, is woven into our DNA wherever you live. It's part of your human experience. And today we're going to talk about courage as it relates to leadership, which is a very important topic and a very important connection between those two concepts, leadership and courage. So without further ado, I'm going to get right into it because we've got a very thick agenda for one hour's time. And here's what we're going to cover. I'm going to share with you some context and some background as to why I believe that courage is the most important of all leadership virtues. I'm going to share with you some information about fear and its debilitating impact on performance. In a way, it becomes the business case as to why courage is so necessary because it's the antidote to fear. And many organizations still use fear and anxiety as a way to promote organizational behavior. Thirdly, I'm going to introduce you to some new concepts associated with courage including some very recent brain research uh, that has been done through MRI studies to look at the, basically the courage button in your brain. So I'll leave that there for now and, uh, and keep you intrigued. And then finally, I'm going to share with you some courage tips along the way to help you personally be more courageous in workplace settings, but also to help you inspire more courage from those folks that you work with or work around or perhaps you are leading. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're going to do today. And to get us started, we'll move right into the context and background. Courage is a skill. A lot of people ask me, you know, Bill, can you really teach courage? And I say, of course you can. You've been learning about courage since you were a little kid. You might remember when you were young that maybe your dad or your mom stood behind your bicycle and they took your training wheels off and suddenly pushed you forward and you wobbled to and fro and you were petrified. Maybe you got a couple of feet down the road and maybe even fell and scraped your knees and they helped you get back up and you did it again and eventually you could ride a bicycle. That was a courage building experience. Or maybe you and a bunch of giggly girlfriends were in the backyard when you were eight years old and you pitched a tent as part of the Girl Scouts and your parents were there and then they went inside and you all told spooky stories. That was a courage building experience. Our need to build courage doesn't stop when we're children because we continue to face fearful and anxiety provoking situations throughout our life. Courage is essential and elemental to the human experience and it is foundational to leadership. 
Secondly, everybody has the capacity to be courageous. Everybody on this webinar attending today already is courageous. The courage is inside of you. Sometimes you activate it, sometimes you don't, but you have access to your courage. Everyone has the capacity to be courageous. People perform better and for longer periods of time with higher engagement and morale when they're operating out of confidence, courage, and conviction than when they're operating out of fear and anxiety. Fourthly, there are things that you can do on a daily basis to practice being courageous to help prepare you for those eventual moments where you're going to need heavy doses of courage. So you can take little leaps before you have to take a giant leap. And then finally, the whole organization benefits when everyone is showing up to work each day with just a little bit more courage. I'm not suggesting that we all start swaggering in a bold way and charging the hill every day. That would take a whole lot of energy. But I am suggesting that if you apply an everyday, more tempered experience of courage, that it will benefit not only you, but in aggregate, it will collectively benefit the organization. So what does that look like? I'm going to share with you just a handful of examples. You know, it's interesting when we do our leadership workshops on courageous leadership, I often ask the question, what's the most courageous thing that you've done at work? And I'm going to share with you just a couple of those answers that I hear. But it's a question that you might ask during a lunch and learn or maybe even just an informal lunch with the people who report to you. Here's just a couple of examples of white collar courage, if you will. Selling an idea to a senior executive, maybe making a budget request of senior executives, delegating a consequential task to an untested employee takes courage, giving a presentation to your boss or your boss's boss or a key customer takes courage. Presentation skills almost always take uh, courage and it's a petrifying experience for a lot of people. How about transferring to another division in another part of the country. You, the folks that are attending today's webinar, ask yourself, did you ever have to make a geographic move for a job and wasn't it a, a scary experience? How about being thrust into an entirely new position that requires an entirely new skill set? And then finally, informing a key customer about a major mistake that your company made or you made or even more difficult, informing a key customer about a mistake that they made. All of those are situations that take courage. In June, I had the opportunity to travel worldwide, and I went to London and Japan and Singapore and Hong Kong and Sydney uh, conducting courageous leadership workshops. And I asked this question, what's the most courageous thing you ever did at work when I was in Japan? And one person said, I helped people get out of this building when there was an earthquake. So the idea of courage is a, transformal, a transforma transformational. Uh, it has the potential to be uh, quite large in its magnitude. It can be a small thing like speaking up to your boss, or it can be a large thing like helping people out of a building during an earthquake. Those are just a couple of examples. But in each of these examples, you might consider this continuum that ranges from comfort to discomfort, from safety-seeking behavior to opportunity-seeking behavior. In any of those situations I mentioned before, most of us are willing to go out on this safety continuum to some degree. We would define that area as our comfort zone. We're willing to go out a little bit or maybe a lot, depending on who the person is and depending on what the situation is. If you are not in your comfort zone, by definition, then you are in your discomfort zone. And here's the critical thing to know, especially if you're a trainer, like so many of you are on this call today, on this webinar, is that learning and organizational growth and development do not happen in a zone of comfort. It happens in a zone of discomfort. If we move out of comfort, not so far out into discomfort that we are petrified, but in enough that we know that we're getting the physiological responses that tell us we are now in the courage zone, we are now encountering our anxiety and fear, but we are doing so in a way that we are growing as professionals, then we are experiencing our courage in a positive way. So again, this is a central point of the courageous leadership material. 
learning and organizational growth and development at the organizational level and at the individual level don't happen in a zone of comfort. It happens in a zone of discomfort. If you are a trainer, your job is to help shepherd people in an absorbable way into a zone of discomfort. If you are a leader, your job is to move people in an absorbable way into discomfort. Now, once they get into discomfort, by stretching their skills, by encountering something new or challenging, you've got to let them stay there for a while, and as they become more comfortable, that becomes your signal to stretch again. So we modulate between comfort and discomfort. When we do that, when more people are experiencing their discomfort in a way that helps them grow and helps the organization progress, it can have a cultural transformational effect from what I believe goes from less to more, like this. You get less finger pointing when you've got courage in the system and more personal accountability. People saying, you know what, I did it, it's my mistake, I own it, my fault, I'm sorry. You get less change resisting and you get more change embracing when there's more courage in the system. People seek out opportunities to experience their courage and to grow and progress and to change. You get less apathy and resignation because remember, when you're in comfort, if you start to coast, you can only coast in one direction and that's downhill. So if you put courage in the system, you get more stepping up to the plate, people seeking out leadership positions, experiencing initiative. When you have more courage in the system, people speak more candidly with one another, so you get less brown nosing and you get more speaking truth to power. Instead of uh, people pleasing behavior or yes saying behavior, you get more people willing to tell you what's really on their mind or cough up original ideas without fear of how they'll be received. When you have more courage in the system, you get less suspicion and distrust of one another, even within your own company, maybe between departments. And you get people presuming first a positive intent. Most people are showing up each day trying to do the best they can. And if we start from that positive presumption, things go better in the organization. And finally, really importantly, when you've got more courage in the system, you have less fear and anxiety, which has a tremendously debilitating impact on performance, and you get more confidence. So I'd ask you, looking at those two lists, which organization would you rather work in? And I ask you rhetorically, which organization do you work in? If you're a leader, even if you're a trainer, your job is to help create the environment and climate that promotes more of the more and less of the less. All right, I tell you what, I want to pause right here because I want to make sure that today's session is A, useful to all of you, and B, interactive and engaging. So I'd like to get some engagement right now, and I'm going to ask Sarah to come back on so that we can do some poll questions to get your take early on in this webinar about courage. And we've got a series of polling questions, and Sarah, I'd like us to move to poll question number one. Can we do that? Absolutely. So the first one is up there. How courageous do you believe yourself to be? Great. So we've given you, we're going to give you about, well, about 15 or 20 seconds here. We've got the votes are coming in uh, so far. Let's see. We've got, uh, it, it keeps jockeying back and forth here. I'll get, reveal the answers in a moment. Remember, if you're looking at the screen, you can see that the answers range from I'm a courageous superhero to I am very courageous to I am courageous to I'm kind of courageous to I'm a big scaredy cat. So we've got 85% of the votes in. If you're attending the webinar, it'd be great if you could engage and, and uh, go ahead and vote with this on your screen. It's a good way to get a pulse check on your current perception of courage. And let's let it go for about 10 more seconds. And we'll stop the voting and I'll reveal the, how we did. So the re results are in. Let me quickly share them to you. 42% of you, that's the highest average, said that you are courageous, which is terrific. 30% uh, of you said you are very courageous. 4% uh, of you, probably about 8 or 10 people, said that you are courageous superheroes, which is great. I'd love to, I've got something to learn from you. And then 22% of you said that you're kind of courageous, and 3% of you felt that you are big, scaredy cats. And I, I think I'd probably join that group myself. 
So it's an interesting question because it gets you to reflect on how courageous you've been thus far, how courageous you are in your own mind. Now let's take that question and let's switch it a little bit. Think about the people that you work with and let's ask this question. How courageous do you think the folks that you work with are? So we're going to have uh, t check in with these answers right now. And the voting has started. So think for a moment. You just talked about how courageous you are. Now think about the folks that you work with and how courageous you believe they are. Over half of you have voted right now. Waiting some, for some more votes to come in. Again, your answers are ranging from they are courageous superheroes to they are very courageous to they are courageous to they are kind of courageous to they are mostly big scaredy cats. And we're waiting for the results. We've got about 84% of you have voted. Let's give it about another five seconds. If you can get your votes in, that would be great. All right, we'll stop the voting here and see where we landed. And what's interesting is in the previous question, we had a we had at least 4% of you uh, that were courageous superheroes. We had a higher percent who designated yourself as very courageous. The most of you in the last uh, question felt that you are courageous. But in this, we've got 9% of you that think they are very uh, courageous. 25% think they are courageous. But the biggest one is 45% of the folks uh, on the webinar today think that the folks that you work with are kind of just kind of courageous. And a full 20% of you think that they are big scaredy cats. It's kind of interesting because this has been my experience. Whenever we do the Courageous Leadership Workshop, we often do pre-session surveys and we ask this question. And we find that people judge themselves more courageously than those that they work with. And there may be two reasons for that. The first is when you're encountering fear, it may not be transmittable to others. They may not know that you're encountering a fearful situation. So you know what it took for you to do a hard thing and how much courage it took. But when you're watching somebody else, it may in fact look like it's a breeze for them, but inside they're dealing with a lot of fear. So it's very difficult to judge another person's action as to whether it's courageous or not because you just don't know what they were facing. The second thing is, of course, you were rating yourself as an individual, but I was asking you here to think about all the folks that you with, uh, work with, and it might average out that you think that many of them are just kind of courageous. But it's still an interesting question. Let's move to the third question, and that is, in which domain do you commonly exercise more courage? So we're going to go ahead. This is simply at home or at work. So think about when you are being courageous and when you are exercising your courage, where do you do it mostly? At work or at home? And we'll get the answers to come in. We've got about 40% of you. This one's interesting because we've got, it's a, a pretty uh, a dominated answer, and that is what I would say a, a, a clear preference for one of these than the other. And we'll let the uh, scoring go a little bit more. We've got about 75% of you have voted thus far. So where are you more courageous? Where do you exercise it mostly? At home or at work? And we'll give you about five more seconds to get your answers in. Don't overanalyze it. Go with your first response. All right, we'll stop the voting there. And for those of you that voted, 63% of you felt that you exercise more courage at work. And 33% of you, 37% of you, felt that you'd uh, exercise more courage at home. What's interesting about this question is I think that there's a, a couple of things that impact it. One is level in the organization. A lot of times if you are in a position where you're in a leadership role, you have direct reports, you have something, some area, not that just you're responsible for, but that you have some degree of, frankly, control, uh, then we tend to exercise more risk in areas where we feel that we've got responsibility and control. Uh, on the other hand, we avoid those areas where we have less uh, and when we're not in charge, if you will. So there's a level component to this and sometimes there can be a gender component to this. I've asked the same question of about 100 business owners who are about 75% male and this was a very similar statistic to what you had here. Most of them uh, were very comfortable exercising courage at work. On the other hand, I worked with about 100 middle managers who were women in an HR organization from a major consulting company. About 75% of them were women. 
And it was exactly reversed. Most of them were more comfortable taking risk at home or ex exercising their courage at home. So I do think that there may be a, uh, a domain issue here where are you are more in charge. And secondly, there might be a gender issue here as well. Let's move on to the third question. And the third question is, which of the items listed below do you find most difficult? And let's get your, so, so I'm just giving you just a couple of examples here to choose from. Which one do you think is most difficult? Speaking up to your boss, delegating a consequential task, moving into a new role before you're fully prepared for it, making decisions in the absence of full information, accepting critical feedback about your work. Now, these are just a handful of common experiences that require courage, but these are some of the ones that you'd hear in my workshop, for example. But these are uh, just a handful. So let's go ahead and see how you answer. We've got over half of you have voted. It's uh, coming in, again, as one of them is a, a more clear choice for many of you than the others. Still waiting on some of you to vote. Got about 75% of you. This is a, a good question to ask uh, by giving people a series of difficult situations and ask them what's the most difficult because it may mean that there's fear lurking there if it's dear, uh, difficult for you and if there's fear lurk lurking it may also be an opportunity to exercise your courage. It could point in the direction of where you could beef up your courage skills. So let's go ahead and we'll pause it there. 12% of you felt that speaking up to your boss was difficult. 11% of you felt delegating, and some of you may not have the opportunity to de delegate, so maybe you didn't cho choose that. Moving into a new role, uh, only 11% of you, but by far the biggest choice, 51% of you felt that making decisions in the absence of full information was the most difficult for you. And by the way, that is a very common challenge for leaders, whether you're in a new leadership role or a senior leadership role, and yet it's something that you have to do. In fact, you'll be called more to do that more often. The more senior you get in the organization, the less perfect information you'll have, and the more you'll have to re uh, rely on your intuitive executive judgment and accumulated experience, and that becomes obviously risky. And then finally, 15% of you felt that accepting critical feedback about your work uh, was most difficult. And then let's now move to the, I believe it's the fifth question. Let's see. And that is select the worst workplace concept that you think requires the most courage. So let's see what we've got here. Leading others, creativity and innovation, dealing with change, sales, or managing conflict. So where do you think courage is most needed? What's the concept that really most connects to this idea of courage? Getting our votes coming in. Very good. We'll let it go a little bit further. We got about 75% of you have voted thus far. We'll let it go a little bit more. Give it five more seconds. Got 85% of you have voted, which is about the same as the other votes. And we'll go ahead and we'll close it there. About 14% of you felt that leading others was the concept that most closely connected to courage. Creativity and innovation, 8%. 24%, which was the second highest choice, was dealing with change. Sales, only 4% of you felt that that was the workplace concept that connected most to courage. And then 51% of you, by far the majority, twice as much almost than the other answers, was managing conflict. So this idea of interpersonal assertiveness with another human being uh, became the area that required the most amount of courage. So thank you so much, Sarah. We're gonna, we'll pull it back to the presentation and we'll move away from the polls. It's, uh, thank you for the engagement. I appreciate it. And I, thought, I think it's an interesting pulse check on the, your current perceptions of courage. So let's go ahead and we'll move forward and I'll share with you. Here's a, a interesting quote that Aristotle said that courage is the first virtue. It's the first virtue because it makes all the other virtues possible. That's always been the case outside of work. Just think of other important people that have talked about courage in this way. That 
C.S. Lewis said that courage isn't just one of the virtues. It's all of the virtues taken to the testing point. Winston Churchill said that it's not just one of the human qualities. It's the most important of all human qualities. And if that's been true outside of work, why would it be any different inside of work? I mean, just think about all the important concepts that connect to the idea of courage. To be a leader means to render bold decisions that some people are going to disagree with. Leadership takes courage. To be an innovator means to come up with groundbreaking, often tradition-defying ideas. The greatest ideas almost always start out as blasphemy. So to be an innovator, you have to be willing to be transgressive, and that takes courage. To be a great salesperson or business developer or entrepreneur means that you have to have an appetite for risk and that you've got to knock on hundreds of doors in the face of rejection over and over again. To be a great salesperson takes courage. And yet, how many of you on today's webinar have ever gone to a workshop that dealt exclusively with building courage? Probably no one. You've gone to all sorts of other kinds of workshops on leading change and understanding culture and generational differences and business writing and presentation skills, and guess what? My company does all of those too. But to date, there really haven't been any workshops dealing with courage, and yet if you get the courage right as the operating system, all of those other things, managing change, managing conflict, presentation skills, become less effortful. So it becomes important to build people's courage first as a proposition before, uh, instead of having it as an afterthought. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the, just a couple of background facts for you. According to a biannual survey done by IBM, creativity is the number one desired leadership competency of the future. Why? And these all connect to courage because they, it requires bold ideas mistake-making, and overcoming resistance. 78% of 500 executives surveyed by SHRM say that encouraging employees to take risks would have a strong or very strong influence on their decision to join another company, and yet only 40% say their companies currently offer this encouragement. Companies that encourage employees to communicate openly, including about misdeeds, have at least a 5% shareholder return that's larger than other companies. These, again, become more of the business case for why courage is important. I want to share with you some of my own background on courage, because I think that courage is a concept that's personal, and I want to let you understand why I became so enamored with the topic. Well, I, and I don't mean to brag. I know there's people from all over the world on today's webinar, but so far as I know, I'm one of the only people with a courage license and this is actually my license plate. <laughs> now that shouldn't require, you know, that's not what qualifies me to talk about courage. In fact, I would say like some of the folks on today's webinar, what qualifies me is that I'm a big scaredy cat. But I've done some things and had some unusual life experiences that helped others encounter theirs. Prior to starting my company, Giant Leap Consulting, nine years ago, I worked with a company called Accenture. And I was with Accenture for six years in their change management and human performance practice. And I was the very first full-time internal executive coach for the company. And during that time, I coached regularly partners and associate partners, about 35 of them. And what I found was that most of those partners, and these were very powerful, very leader-like people, the struggles that they would have typically always came down to an interpersonal confrontation that they were avoiding. And I realized that that had a lot to do with courage. Prior to that, I was with a company called Executive Adventure, and we used to take executives in the outdoors and do executive team building programs. Again, we would help them through problem solving te uh, techniques that took a lot of risk, but then the conversations that were rich afterwards took a certain expression of vulnerability, and that took courage. But what really informs my own personal experience is for seven years, I used to travel around the country and different parts of the world as a member of the U.S. high diving team. I am a former professional high diver in addition to an organizational development professional that used to dive from heights that scale to over 100 feet into small pools that were only about 10 feet deep, traveling at speeds in excess of 50 miles an hour into these small pools. And here's the thing, I'm a high diver who is afraid of heights, and I say it in the present tense. What's ha what happened to me, though, was 
with this debilitating fear of heights, as I was a high school professional, as I, I was a, a good diver in high school, I started to get offered scholarships. And they would always ask me about, well, tell me about your high board list of dives. And I hadn't learned high board because I was so petrified of heights. So through the patience of a coach who believed in my potential more than I believed in it myself, who held me accountable to that potential, and who ushered me into a discomfort zone, I was able to slowly, incrementally face higher levels of heights and encounter my own fear, thus activating my own courage. It was such a redeeming experience for me that eventually I got a full scholarship to college and then traveled around the world. The guy who was afraid of heights became a professional high diver. And this is kind of how it works for all of us. Each one of us has a high dive to face, personally and professionally, sometimes many times over. The question becomes, where are you playing it too safe? And maybe you're the only one who knows it. The question is, again, what's your high dive? It's amazing. I've spoken to many radio interviewers in promotions of my book. And I would say that there's an uncanny number of radio personalities who start their careers in broadcasting because they were stutterers. In fact, this happened just a week ago when I was talking to Ed Cohen, who has globalhr.com. Uh, and he likewise started out as a, a stutterer. It happens all the time when I'm doing these interviews. And so what I want to suggest to you is that your fear, that thing that is your challenge, that thing that provokes you, that hangs over you, may be your opportunity if you walk through it instead of away from it, a way of experiencing your own courage. But that means moving into a zone of discomfort. All right. I want to share with you a couple of quick thoughts here. I want you to think of a leader who you most admire. What are some of the things that that leader does that builds people's courage? Now I want you to think of a leader that you least admire, and what are some things that that leader does that actually erodes people's courage? Because I believe that there's two different leadership dispositions. You have leaders that build people's courage, that by encountering them, they help move you into a zone of discomfort in an absorbable way. They believe in your potential maybe more than you believe in it yourself. They hold you accountable to that potential. They give you tough feedback, but in a way that helps you grow, not to make you feel small. And literally, you become encouraged. They put courage inside of you. I call those leaders fillers. But then we also know that there are those other leaders who they focus so much on risk and the consequences of risk that they inject you with fear and anxiety. Their big concern is don't screw up. And because if they make you really, really afraid, they think that that's how you'll be conscientious enough to do a good job. So they motivate you through fear. In the process of injecting you with fear and anxiety, they displace your courage. You become a more frightened professional. And in the process, they have displaced your courage. You have become discouraged. They are what I call spillers. Now, most of us have encountered both of these kind of professionals. I want to share with you a couple of quotes, and some of these are from a, a, another author, a wonderful book uh, by Robert Sutton. Uh, I won't share the title of the book because it's got a swear word in it that rhymes with glass, uh, but it's, uh, it's a wonderful book if you go and see on Amazon or any of your other uh, providers. Uh, Robert Sutton, you'll find his book, but here are just a couple of the quotations from his book about these spiller kind of leaders. My boss gave the first Employee of the Month award to himself. My boss showed appreciation by giving an employee an iPod, except the employee's deaf. My boss eats pork chops in team meetings and then picks her teeth. My boss encouraged nurses to get extra Valium so the staff could have a couple of personal for their own personal use. My boss ordered an employee to collect money for her from the rest of us to buy a $600 bracelet for her birthday. These are actual real-life examples of spiller types of bosses. And I think that you probably could think of a boss or two, that, uh, an example that would underscore this. Now, I'm going to show you one more example, and it came from one of my courageous leadership workshop, and it's frightening, but it's real. My boss told me that I would get a poor performance review unless I slept with him. There are these kind of leaders, and the question becomes, what kind of leader are you? Are you somebody who puts courage inside of people? Are you a filler, 
or are you somebody who's more concerned with making them really afraid so that they'll do a good job, in which case that you may be a spiller. And listen to this. People with spiller bosses are twice as likely to arrive late, do less work, and take sick days when they aren't sick, according to a Florida State University study. More importantly, employees working for bad bosses are 39% more likely to develop coronary heart disease, and that's from a Finnish study in 2009. Think about that. In other words, the consequences of a bad boss, a spiller boss, literally could be the acceleration of your death by the stress that they cause you. So courage becomes a really important proposition. I'm going to underscore that a little bit more with some interesting statistics about the impact on fear on performance. A third of U.S. employees waste at least 20 hours of work time each month complaining about their bosses. This is according to HR Executive Magazine. And the cost of that, if you could aggregate it, is in excess of $360 billion a year. Now, wouldn't that money be better served in the economy right now? Stress-related illnesses account for at least a third of all worker absenteeism, and much of that stress is due to the intimidation by people feel by their workplace. In a recent study of workplace bullying, 37% of American workers report being bullied on the job. And according to a UK study, 25% of all those who are bullied and 25% of those who witness the bullying will quit the workforce. And according to some research, again by FSU, fearful workers have high levels of job tension, nervousness, and mistrust, are less likely to take on additional tasks, and here these two are very important. They're twice as likely to be depressed, and we know that there's a strong negative correlation between high depression and negative job performance, and 33% more likely to have sleep disorders. Both of those impact performance in a significantly negative way. So the question becomes, why would any red-blooded capitalist choose to stoke people's fear and anxiety as a way to increase performance and profits? It gives you exactly the opposite of what you're wanting. Courage becomes a better proposition from a, a mere business standpoint than injecting people with fear and anxiety. According to the Gallup Management Organization Journal in 2011, fear is the primary barrier to organizational success. And according to a new book by the Gallup Organization coming out this August, managers must create a culture of courage. Courage killers must be rooted out and dealt with swiftly and strongly. Now these are the folks who gave you strength finders, which we all know is so big in the workforce right now. Now they're switching their thinking to fear-based organizations and the negative consequences of it, i.e. they're starting to look at the importance of courage as a proposition in the workplace. I want to switch now because we, I don't want to get too negative by looking at fear and courage and I want to make sure that we transition into a more positive input. And that what it hinges on is the brain research that I alluded to early on in the webinar. Some really fascinating research has come out of Israel where a number of researchers have looked at MRI studies, looking at the brain, looking basically for what I call, and probably I shouldn't be calling it this, this, but I do call it the courage button, the place in your brain that might be associated with courage. The reason they started looking at this is because it's long been known that there's a place in your brain associated with fear. It's called the amygdala, which is the Latin word for almond because it's an almond-shaped part of your brain. It's about the size of an almond. And here's how you find it. If you want to know where the almond-shaped part of your brain is, it's called the amygdala. Take a pencil and stick it in your eye, and take another pencil and stick it in your ear. And where they cross, that's where the amygdala is. It's bilobal, so you'd have to do it in both eyes and both ears. I'm speaking metaphorically now. Please don't actually do that on the webinar. So they got to thinking, okay, we know that there's a place called the amygdala that's associated with fear. This is always on heightened alert. It's part of your self-preservation system. It keeps you away from danger, and it's very important to the human species in terms of self-preservation. But if there's an aspect of your brain associated with fear, could there also be an aspect of your brain associated with courage? So they did some very interesting research. They took people... A, uh, specific population of people, and they put them in MRI studies. They had them lie prone in an MRI machine. Behind them was a conveyor belt. On the conveyor belt was a box, and on top of the box, strapped to the box, was a certain object. 
Now, in their hand, they had a device that could move the conveyor belt closer to their head or farther away by the press of a button. So they were looking for intentional courage. Again, this was a significant, this was a specific population of people who I had identified themselves as being afraid of this certain object that I'm going to reveal in just a moment. But it was within their control to either intentionally experience courage or to push the box away. They also were monitoring their physiology in addition to looking at their brains. So, of course, all of you are curious as to what was on the box. These are people who identified themselves as being afraid of snakes, and these are the actual snakes. This is an actual snake that was used in the study. So they took people who were afraid of snakes, and they said, all right, let's see if they can intentionally be courageous by pulling the snake, and we know that they're already petrified of snakes, closer to their head while they're going through the MRI. And what they found was that this little other part of the brain would light up in those people that were capable of bringing the snake closer to their brain. This little part of the brain is not the amygdala, and it's called the subgunal anterior cingulate cortex, what I, an easier phrase that I call the courage button. The interesting thing is, for the courage button to light up, they had to report themselves as either not being afraid, but their physiology registered that they were very afraid, or they had to re designate themselves as being very afraid, but their physiology didn't register any fear. In other words, there had to be dissonance. Only in those instances where they said they were very afraid and their physiology was afraid, they wouldn't, in fact, pull the uh, snake closer. So the implication of this is this, and it's really profound. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the presence of courage. And your cognitive ability to subdue your fear becomes very important to experiencing courage. So again, this tight relationship between fear and courage. All right, so that's where it hinges. Now let's move into courage directly. And I want to introduce you to three different aspects of courage that I call the three buckets of courage. Instead of looking at this large, intimidating mass that we say, wow, that's courage, that's, that's only for heroes and I'm no hero. I want you to cut it down to size and look at three different types of courage because in there you may find that in fact in some respects or in, according to one of these buckets of courage, maybe you're more courageous than you give yourself credit for. So here's the three buckets of courage, what I call try, trust, and tell. I'm going to drill down here just on a couple of them, on the three buckets. The first kind of courage is try courage. It's associated with stepping up to the plate. It's initiative. It's bold action. It's the courage that we find in the first attempt. When you're doing something hard that you've never encountered before, for you, you're having to move outside into your discomfort zone. You're experiencing your courage because of the fearful feelings that you're encountering and moving through. It's trying something new for your very first time. It requires overcoming inertia, and it requires an expenditure of energy also comes with a risk, and the risk is that your actions, by taking it, may harm you or it may harm others. Now let's move on to the second bucket of courage. It's not the courage of bold action. It's the courage that it takes to trust other people. Sometimes that can be the courage of inaction. So the courage of inaction is what I call trust courage. It's the courage it takes to let go, follow other people's lead release your need to control or to be right. It's the courage of vulnerability to allow yourself to open up to other people and assume the risks that come with that. And of course, what's the risk is that other people's actions might harm you. By trusting others, maybe they'll betray you. And then you'll experience that betrayal and may not want to trust again. So it's very hard for some people, particularly folks that are more jaded, to experience their, their trust courage. Now let's look at the third bucket of courage. And the third bucket of courage is what I call tell courage. It's the courage of voice or assertiveness. It's not the courage of bold action. It's not the courage of trusting others. It's the courage of speaking truth to power. It's the courage it takes to assert your own ideas and own up to them. It's a courage to stand on principle for yourself. This is the courage that it takes to engage in interpersonal conflict, which most of you on the phone designated as being the area that requires the most application of courage. 
and that's been my experience in these courageous leadership workshops that we do as well. What's interesting is that the lower you go in the organization, the more difficult it is to get to tell courage. People at higher levels seem more willing to engage with tell courage with one another. What's the risk of tell courage? That if you tell people what you really think, you might be cast outside of the group. And that, you know, human beings have a very strong need to affiliate and join a tribe and a feeling of sense of belonging with one another. But if you tell people what you really think and it's not on board with what they think, they might cast you outside of the group. So these are the three buckets of courage, three different dimensions of courage, if you will. So maybe you're better in these than in others, or maybe you've got one of the buckets that you might need to work on a little bit more. So let me give you a quick quiz, and we'll just do this rhetorically, but you, you and perhaps the folks that you're sitting with, interacting with here on the webinar, uh, you can kind of guess as to what you think the most appropriate answer is. You privately but assertively disagree with your boss about a decision that she made. Which of these do you think it falls into? Which bucket? Now, it involves assertiveness, so we would say that's tell courage. Let's look at this one. You step up to lead a major strategic initiative, something you've never done before, and that's the clue. It's a pioneering event for you, so that would be try courage. How about this one? You have a lot of negative things to say about your boss behind his back, but never directly to his face. Now this one is the lack of courage. Which bucket would it fall into? This would be lack of tell courage. If you had more tell courage, you'd speak truth to that boss. How about this one? You let your boss in on a personal matter that's affecting your work. So this is, you'd think that it would be tell courage, but really this one's about trust. This is trust courage. This is vulnerability. This is you opening up and disclosing and exposing yourself. And then how about this one? While going on vacation, your boss inadvertently leaves your personnel file on her desk but you take a peek to see what's in your file. Now, my hunch would be that if you had a strong bucket of trust courage, you wouldn't do this, but if your trust bucket was low, you would do it, lack of trust courage. So that gives you a little sense of the three buckets of courage. And we cover both the fillers and spillers concept and the three buckets of courage in the Courageous Leadership Workshop, and we have a profile, the Courageous Leadership Profile, which HRDQ cells that helps you identify which of these bucket is highest and which of these buckets is lowest for you as an individual. And there's also a 360 degree feedback version of these three bucket uh, profile. All right, so now I want to move to the last segment of the webinar and then we'll open it up to questions, which I so look forward to. It's my favorite part actually. Uh, but I want to share with you just a couple of tips before we do that about increasing your own courage and inspiring more courageous people uh, behavior among the folks that you lead. Increasing your own courage. First, know your own courage history. Reflect on your courage history and your career history and think about those courageous moments that you've already experienced. What are some lessons that you can learn from? Maybe you opened, you know, started your own business. Maybe you moved your family to a different part of the country when your company asked you to. Maybe you led a new strategic initiative. Maybe you just became responsible for employees and you hadn't been on the management track before. What's a courageous moment from your past? Consider your career regrets, those moments where you lacked courage, and what can you learn from that? And think about your current role as an executive, and what lessons about courage can you learn from your past that you can draw upon today? Where are you playing it to safe at work, and how does your career want you to be more courageous? Let's go on to tip number two, and this one deals with tell courage. Confirm with your boss that he or she does not want you to be a yes person and a brown noser. Really, literally ask them during a performance review, hey boss, I, I just got to know something because I want to make sure that I meet your expectations. Do you want me to agree with every decision that you make or do you want me to agree with every idea that you have? Now 95% of your bosses are going to say no, I don't. I want you to push back. I want you to disagree when you feel strongly about something. Then say, great. Then give me some feedback from you how can, how can I do that in a way that you'll actually be receptive to my feedback and not meet it with resistance? Because I want to make sure that I'm able to get through with you in a way that's not producing your defensiveness. And then they will give you some coaching. 
at that moment in time then, fast forward to maybe six months, a year later, when you have to disagree with your boss, now refer back to the ground rule that you and your boss had established and say, hey boss, remember when I promised you that I would be committed to not being a yes person for you? I'm going to honor that commitment right now with what I have to say next. So establishing the ground rule. All right, now I'll give you the third tip here. And to tee this up, I want to uh, get a quote from Richard Branson. Now, Richard Branson, as you all know, is one of the great entrepreneurs of the modern age. He has started over 200 different Virgin companies, including Virgin Airlines, Virgin Records, Virgin Cell Phones, Virgin Galactic. And he says this about a client of mine. From, one, from day one, I realized what a spunky girl she was. I knew she had a fear of heights, so I took her up 10,000 feet in a hot air balloon, made her climb, climb a 150-foot rope ladder to the top of it, and then made her have a cup of tea with me. She didn't overcome her fear of heights, but she had the courage to do it. And he's talking about this person, who's, again, a client of mine, and wrote the forward to my book, Courage Goes to Work. I've worked with Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, on four different occasions. What's interesting about this very petite, demure individual is she is as bold a human being as I have ever met in my whole life. And here's what she says, and here's what the tip for you is. People respond with courage of their own when they see me take chances and step up to challenges. If you want other people to, take, uh, to be more courageous in your workplace, to create an environment of courage, you can't just tell them and dictate that they'll do that. The best place to start is to be a good role model of courageous behavior. So be a role model. Jump first. All right, those are just a couple of tips. There's over 100 in the book Courage Goes to Work. I also want to point out that if you go to the Courage Goes to Work website, which is entirely free, if you go out there on the Members tab, put the word Courage in the login, and you will have access to a bunch of free downloadable information about Courage Goes to Work. I also now want to open it up to questions. Uh, because I've been dying to hear from you and what questions you may have. I know I've been going at about a million miles a minute here and, and uh, gave you a lot, of com a lot of content to absorb. So, Sarah, let's open it up to some questions. Absolutely. Good. And we have a couple questions that have already come in, so I'm going to start with those. But feel free to send in all of the questions that you have. Um, if we run out of time today, um, Bill will make sure that he uh, connects uh, by email, and we'll get those out to you. So our first question is from John. And um, John's really uh, reflecting on the economy here and saying, how do we best deal with the fear for our job in being courageous in the workplace? John, really, that's such a key question. It's a key question right now. I mean, the, the volatility in the market right now, in the economic workplace, in, the, in you know, just sort of the zeitgeist of our time, it's just it's amazing. And, and we've been dealing with this economic funkiness now for, since 2008. What I would say is, John, that in situations where there's a lot of fear and anxiety, remember that continuum that I showed you that ranges from safety-seeking behavior to opportunity-seeking behavior? Whenever there's fear in a system, uh, the vast majority of people will shepherd themselves over to the safety-seeking behavior. They do that in the workplace because they want to sort of, uh, they, they don't want to be found out. They want to hunker down and they want to play it safe because survival is uh, what they want. They want to make sure that, look, if I can just sort of hang out, hide under my desk, don't make waves, I won't be noticed when there's the next round of cuts. Uh, and I understand that mentality. That said, if we all adopt that philosophy, then we will never get out of this economic trough. It will, it's always sort of the entrepreneurs that lead our way out of the trough. And that means that this is just the time when the organization needs people to step up with new ideas, revenue generating ideas, or even ideas about how to cleverly cut costs. So senior executives want new ideas right now. Uh, that means biting your tongue less. That means extending yourself, at least in the innovation space, by offering new ideas uh, in order to best serve the organization. Now is the time to exercise some degree of boldness. And it may be as simple as having a conversation with your boss or a person more senior with you saying, listen, I really want to understand very clearly what the goals of the organizations are right, uh, organization is right now so that I can contribute to it and in so doing, apply my courage in a way that best serves the organization. So, so that's my, my own take on it. And, and 
and John, I'm not being Pollyannish. Uh, that, that said, I'm a guy who started his business in 2001 in the heart of a recession. And here I am nine years later, li having lived through that experience, you know, just fine. So I think that your organization, senior leaders want more ideas. They want people to not be uh, wallflowers, if you will. They want people to show more initiative, to take on more and complex responsibilities. This is not a time to be invisible, which is the death knell for any aspiring career. Great, thank you. We have a question that's come in here from Kate that um, I think will end up leading into a couple of the other questions we have coming in here. Um, but Kate asks, do you find that individuals can affect the organizational courage, or is courage and change more likely to be a result of group action? I like the question. I think that, you know, we we go high level and we go individual person. So we go from aggregate to organizational concepts, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the individual act of courage collectively aggregated. In other words, it's it's the person who asks the question, you know, what is her courageous act? What's the action she needs to take? What's a what's a commitment that she could make to have a courageous conversation with her boss immediately following today's webinar or with a direct report immediately following today? What is her action? Now, if each individual commits to doing one courageous action, then I believe it has a aggregate effect on the organization. That said, when Giant Leap does strategic planning, we do a lot of that. The National Science Foundation, for example, is our biggest strategic planning uh, client. We come in at the group level and work to create bold strategies that are captivating for an entire organization of people to, that resonates by activating everybody's courage. So it's got to work on a high level. It certainly you know, helps if the organization has goals that are not boring and goals that inspire our courage and activate it, uh, but it also means that at the individual le level, each one of us is going to have to have some level of contribution towards that larger organizational goal. So the answer is both. Good, good. And, and we, have, um, we have a couple of these coming in from different people, so I'll, I'll sort of summarize here. Um, and I know that we've got, um, as you mentioned earlier, international um, clients with us on the line, which is really exciting. Um, and so some of the questions have come in around, um, in your experience, um, are there any cultural differences um, that you're finding relative to courage? And that also then sort of gets extended to the gender as well between men and women. Mm. I appreciate the question, and and I love traveling, and I, you know, to, and doing the courageous leadership workshops. I failed to mention that I was also in Canada in in June as well. Uh, I do see some uh, differences. You, you know, the United States has always had sort of a very high appetite for risk taking. Most of the people who entered the United States, unless you were indigenous and Native American, if you will, uh, came. The, you know, the common experience of of most American families is immigration, and that is the people who left their home, uh, left the safe shores of their country to gravitate towards the United States. My own grandmother, for example, left the shores of Southern Ireland when she was 17, my great-grandmother, and never went back. And that took a great deal of courage. So you might have had a lot of people that sort of already had that appetite. Um, so you know, America has sort of that verb, uh, if you will, the United States, I should say. That said, in other countries, all countries have courage, just as ha how does it play out. Uh, the United States might have too much uh, latitude for taking risks. You know, we have, it's very common for most people that buy a house in the United States to have a 30-year mortgage. But you know what? In Australia, you get a five-year mortgage. Five years is what you get. You don't have a 30-year mortgage. If you can't pay your house off in five years, you don't get a mortgage. So there's, you know, that's kind of smart risk-taking if you ask me. I was one of the ways to answer this question. I get a lot of insight, frankly, from uh, taxi drivers when I'm in another country. And I was talking to a taxi driver in Japan, and we, I was admiring Japan because it, it had. I, I was there within you know a month or two after the earthquake and the Fukushima uh, nuclear meltdown, and I was admiring and I'm so impressed by the Japanese people about how they they always just get the you know few complaints, let's just get to work at rebuilding our country. And I asked him, and, and he, the taxi driver said, that that's true, we, we, you know, we're very hard, uh, we're, we're heads down, we, we all coll collaborate together to get the job done. He said, but our society tends to be a little too 
our society tends to be a little too polite, that we could benefit by pushing back more when we disagree collectively as a society, such as with the Fukushima executives. So there's a deference to authority that you find in Japan that you don't find so much in the United States, for example. We, we almost have an anti-authority streak, as do the Irish, for example. So, so each country, I would say, has a little bit of nuance of distinction about try, trust, and tell, which one they tend to do more of. Um, and then from the gender standpoint, my experience has been that males t tend to take a lot of sort of financial gambles or more willing to, and they also are show-offs. So they've done studies with 17-year-old skateboarding males, and when females are watching, they tend to try more difficult tricks and thus get more injuries. Women, on the other hand, if you just watch a woman at a department store when she's getting on a down escalator, will pause before she gets on it to make sure she's safe and then step down on it. The man will be talking to another man, to doing a Blackberry message at the same time, won't even be looking at his feet as he set, steps on the down escalator. So men to take uh, physical risk tend, and I'm, and I'm you know, generalizing wildly here, men tend to take more physical and financial risk. And I think women are better at the trust bucket. They're more willing to disclose emotionally and, uh, and share what's going on for them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you to everyone for participating today. Keep sending in your questions that you have, um, and we'll make sure that Bill gets those and is able to respond. If, we, um, if you have additional questions that come in afterwards, you can email those to, to us directly as well. As an exclusive offer, you do receive free shipping on any courageous leadership purchase at our website. It is hrdq.com. You have a 30-day um, risk-free to check out the material. We really appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative.